Before we begin, I would like to thank you all for supporting this series all the way up to Volume 7. I also want to thank everybody who suggested stories for this collection long ago. For those who still want to request stories, feel free to do so for future videos in this series. Without further ado, here is 7 Micropastas to keep you up tonight. Volume 7 I've never been a very sociable kid. To be completely honest, I've never really seen the point of it. People talk about the same things over and over again. Meaningless things. The weather, the weekend, work, school. As I've gotten into my late teens, I've grown to loathe it. Whenever I hear the kids in my classes or in the halls talking about the same old crap and giggling, my blood boils. People avoid me mostly, which can be expected. A few of the more brutish kids pick on me, but I just ignore them. I spend my weekends alone, indoors. I like to play the piano in my spare time. It's very therapeutic. It's like my meditation. When I'm playing it, I usually think about life. I think about people and my general dislike towards them. I think about the kids who pick on me at school, and I think about the recent disappearances of kids in my surrounding area. They were all kids of similar age to myself, mostly girls, some even from my school, my classes. There have been eight in total. I've been keeping track of them, you see. I follow their stories in the newspapers quite closely. I'm very keen on what the police find at the scene and always keep an eye out for any evidence they find that might lead them to the killer. The profiles are always the same. They are usually discovered in back alleys or in ditches, always with their throat slit, in a clean, precise manner. The curious part that the police can't seem to figure out is why the victims always have their tongues removed, ripped out from their jaws. And I quote the newspaper when I say this, while the victims were still alive. They say it's the worst serial killing they've had in my country for years. The killer is calm, meticulous, and leaves not one shred of evidence at the crime scenes. Whatever the reason, my classes have been getting noticeably quieter as the noisiest of the kids have one by one gone missing, only to be found days later, mutilated and dumped as if they were trash. It's so much more pleasant. I can concentrate properly now. There's still one girl in my class though who really grinds my gears with her high-pitched whiny voice and that piercing laugh that seems to penetrate deep into my skull every time I have the displeasure of hearing it. I heard her again today, loud and irritating as usual, and couldn't help thinking that she used that tongue of hers far too much. I might even go as far as to say that she didn't deserve to have it at all. In a small orphanage in a small village in Russia, there is a young boy. His hair is jet black and messy and tattered jeans and an old dingy gray shirt. Nothing is known of him. For ten years, he sat in the bed in his room, never moving, never blinking, never eating or sleeping. And these ten years, he has not seemed to age at all, continuing to look like a seven-year-old boy. The only thing that proved he was alive is the slow rise and fall of his chest as he breathes and the refusal to take his eyes off anyone who enters the room alone. A lone psychiatrist came over in an attempt to find out why the boy had done nothing in ten years. He entered the room and shut the door behind him. Thirty minutes later, the orphanage's nurses came to check on the two of them. Opening the door, she saw the child, still sitting, still not moving eyes 
fixed on her. However, something seemed different. He appeared a slight amount larger, not by much, but enough to make him look like a late eight or early nine-year-old. The psychiatrist was no longer in the room. The door was the only exit, as the room had no windows, vents, or anything. And it was, in fact, in the exact center of the orphanage. He continued to sit, only seen occasionally by the lady who came in to check on him, and she never closed the door upon entry. A week or so later, two law enforcement personnel entered the orphanage, demanding to speak to the boy about the disappearance of the psychiatrist. The two of them entered, closing the door behind him, as the head of the orphanage stood outside the door. Thirty minutes passed, and not a sound came from the room. The head eased the door open. The boy was still on the bed, but the officers were no longer there. The boy was now quite noticeably bigger, about the size of a 15-year-old. His skin was darker than usual, and he looked angrier than ever. But one thing remained the same. His cold, unforgiving eyes that stared at whoever entered. Eventually, the law organized a large group of ten officers to speak to the boy. They entered the room and left the door open until one of the younger orphans ran up and shut it, apparently in a daze. The head quickly ran to reopen the door, and upon doing so, froze him in horror. A low rumbling noise came from the room. One more. If you return to that orphanage, you will see it still continues to run. The orphans live in good care, health, and education. However, there is one room that you will see is boarded up and far from enterable. If you ask what is behind it, you will be removed forcefully from the orphanage. However, when no one's looking, if you place your ear to the door, you will hear a low, ominous, growling noise. And if you listen for a bit, you will hear one more. There was a house on the edge of town, but this was an odd house. I remember it clearly, every single day of walking home from school. I was eight at the time, and walking to school alone was something that made me feel like a big boy. The house was something I'll never forget. Whenever I walked by, to or from school, I always saw that strange man in the window. He'd just stand there and stare at me, but with a smile that you'd normally consider friendly, yet there was something unsettling about it. There was an odd house on the edge of town, but this was an odd house. As days passed, I became more and more uncomfortable walking down that road. Yet it was the only road I knew, and the one road I was told to follow by my mother every single day. Not a single exception. I tried waking up early and setting off late, yet nothing stopped the man from standing there, with his creepy, ominous smile, the darkness behind him cloaking his body, making his head seem like a floating apparition. As days and days went on by, something seemed stranger and stranger, creepier and creepier. The most eerie part was that I couldn't even tell what kept changing. There was an old, run-down house on the edge of town, but this one was an odd house. Day by day, tormented by the overshadowing presence of his face in the window, I saw the most horrifying sight that one night. You see... It was winter, so it tended to get darker very early. His face. Its face. The first thing I noticed was the smile. The smile had stretched so far, it literally went from one ear, stretching all the way to the other, showing a wide, horrifying, and creepy smile that I will never forget. Then I noticed the skin of its face had become 
gray. The skin almost looked like cloth from down where I was. It looked like... It looked as if it would be very easy to rip off. I wonder what it would feel like to just rip someone's skin off like that. I rushed home crying to my mother, begging her to never make me go again. There was an old, run-down house, barely standing on the edge of town. But this was the devil's house. When I begged my mother to come with me to school so she could see this horror and put a stop to it, it wasn't there. Day by day, we walked down the same path, and no matter what, the creature I saw in the window wouldn't be there. As days passed, I began to see the horrific creature everywhere. No matter where I went, its presence, chilling me to the very core, filling me with terror. I saw it in the mirrors, in the doors, through the windows, on the dark, switched-off computer screen. I was tormented constantly tormented and I cried cried to my parents yet they yet they put it up as nothing but children's wild imaginations sometimes I awoke crying sobbing to myself quietly at night covering my ears and my eyes closed I don't know why I don't know why I was like this but I just felt pure fear within me and I was petrified unable to move my mind was poisoned by the creature I saw that day and these occurrences happened more and more often until it was every night. There was a house in the town. I lived in this house. I locked the door, moved my bed, my bookshelf, everything in front of it to stop them from coming in. My parents, they help that thing. They make me walk to school because they wish that thing, that demon, would take me. I see it everywhere. But within these recordings, these recordings, I tell this story over and over. I feel weak. I haven't had food or water in a long time. Longer than I can remember. My room is filled with dried vomit and urine as I sit here recording this story over and over. My voice is brittle and frail. My body nothing but skin and bones. My hand shakes barely having the strength to hold the device. I'm safe here, in my room, recording this story over and over. I'm safe here, with my recording device, recording this story over and over. I'm safe here as I await my end, recording this story over and over. There was a house on the edge of town, but this was an odd house. I remember it clearly, every single day of walking from school. I was eight at the time, and walking to school alone was something I felt like a big boy for. Do you have someone you hate? Someone you would do anything to hurt, pay any price for vengeance. If so, you may want to consider visiting Lightless City. To get there, go to any decent sized city and find a deserted alleyway at night. Go into it and close your eyes as tightly as you can. Whisper, Lightless City, and concentrate on the darkness. You've probably noticed that there are faint colors and abstract shapes you can make out if you try to focus your eyes when they're closed. Watch those images go by. After a few minutes, the images should start to get clearer and brighter. When this happens, they'll start taking on detailed forms, images of violent murders, deformed animals, and similar things. No matter what you see, Keep your eyes closed. You'll start to lose track of time, but eventually the images will stop, and you'll see pure darkness. Nothing but deep black, no colors or shapes. When you're certain that you see pure darkness, open your eyes. You will now be in a very dark city. There won't be a single light or star in the sky. You should be able to see a faint dark blue outline of the tall buildings surrounding you. 
Make your way out of the alley and walk as quietly as you can down the sidewalk in any direction. If you hear any movement, run. Run as quickly as you can away from the noise. There are animals in Lightless City. It's too dark to make out the details, but they're the size of large wild felines and will kill any human they catch. Keep moving until you reach an area with smaller buildings, the edge of the city. A child will approach you, his face dully glowing, letting you see that he is eyeless. He will ask, Will you share your light with me? Say yes. The child will reach for your face and rip out your right eye. It will be painful, but there shouldn't be any bleeding or open wound. The child will thank you and leave. Keep walking, and a tall man will appear before you. Whose light do you wish to have taken away? Speak the name of the person you hate, and as soon as you say their name, they will go completely and irreversibly blind. Is your hatred satisfied? The man will ask. If it is, say yes, and you will awaken in the alley. If not, say no, and the man will disappear. Keep walking. You will come across another eyeless child. Will you share your light with me? Say yes, and your left eye will be torn out, leaving you blind. Keep walking, and the tall man will appear again. Although you of course will have to rely on his voice. Whose life do you wish for the darkness to claim? Say the name of the one you hate, and they will die. You will not be asked if your hatred is satisfied this time, and you will not be able to return to the alley. I told you to make sure you really hated someone before doing this. You will spend the rest of your life wandering around Lightless City, blind, with only your hatred to keep you warm. For some people, that's enough. I'm so tired of this. You are in and out, sometimes completely ignoring me, sometimes just staring at me for extended periods of time. You study me, like I'm the one who will give you answers. I'm the one who will save you. The thing is, I think I can. I want to pull you into my world and take you away from all the things that hurt you. I can't count the number of times I have seen you weep, and I can't help but do the same. When you are sad, I am sad. When you smile, I smile. No one knows you the way that I do. And no one has seen what I've seen. Who else could watch you throw up and still want to be with you? You even squeeze pimples when I'm around. That is an indication of intimacy, of true loyalty, of pure companionship. Before you left this morning, you spent a long time looking into my eyes and not saying a word. Your eyes. They told me everything I needed to hear. You feel the same. I know it. You adore me the way I adore you, on the border of obsession. Your eyes do not lie. We are kindred spirits. In essence, we are twins, deserving of a lifetime together, an existence devoid of harsh reality. I can take you there. In fact, I have decided that tonight is the night. Tonight is the night that I come to set you free, to set us free. I have waited long enough. Tonight, as you sleep, I will slide out from within the mirror and bring you back with me into my beautiful oblivion. It might happen one morning that you wake up home alone. This could be normal depending on your situation, but this morning will be different. While your environment will all seem exactly the same, you'll notice that everything is quieter than normal. 
If you go outside, you will notice a distinct lack of anything, like birds, insects, or people. As far as you travel, you will not encounter another sentient human being. The entire world will be intact, but empty except for yourself. There are currently over 100,000 missing persons cases in the United States. Some are just normal cases of murder or kidnappings. But in others, the disappearance cannot be explained. And no remains of the person are ever located. Emma used to be my best friend. I sat next to Emma in Mrs. Moyer's class. That's how we first met. After a little while, we did everything together. At recess, we would color in my coloring books and race to see who was fastest. I always was, of course. And I even shared my cookies with her at lunchtime. Something I would never ever do with anyone else. We even acted like each other. At least, most of the time. Sometimes Emma didn't eat her magic red Skittles, and she would get angry and yell a lot. One day, Emma came to class, and she had the prettiest mittens in the whole wide world. They were all pink with big white polka dots, and a little bow on the top of the wrists. Emma showed them for show and tell, and didn't take them off all day. Not even to color. It was that day that she showed her magic Skittles, and she told me that she didn't need them anymore. She explained to me that they tasted yucky anyway, and she threw them away every day after that. I didn't get why she didn't like Skittles anymore. I mean, I always did, but that was Emma. It was after the day she started wearing those mittens that we stopped being best friends. Emma started being mean, and we stopped coloring together, and we didn't race, and she told me that my cookies were all dirty. Now, I know my cookies weren't dirty, my mommy put them in little bags for me, and she always washed her hands. Emma started telling all the kids at our lunch table that their food was dirty, even the ones with the cartoon lunch boxes, and I knew that wasn't true. One day, she just yelled at us and said that our food was so dirty that she couldn't even sit with us. She decided to sit all alone and just stared at her mittens, because even her food was dirty now. I think mittens made people real sick, because Emma never ever took hers off, and she got all white and little. Her hair was all icky and she smelled kind of funny too, like when mommy would forget to clean the refrigerator. She decided to sit by herself in class, and all she did was fiddle with her mitten hands in the little cubby under her desk, and sharpen her pencils a lot. She wouldn't do her worksheets, or answer Mrs. Moyer, or even go to recess. She spent recess in the bathroom now. It had been a long time since I talked to Emma, and she looked even sicker and whiter, and her skin and hair got all ugly, and she got really, really small. Even her mittens had funny-looking stains on them, and she loved those mittens more than anything. All she ever did was fiddle with her mittens and whisper about all the dirty stuff and tell herself that it was okay because she was clean. It was this day that I talked to her again. It was recess, and I tripped over my shoelaces into some mud. Mrs. Moyer told me to go to the bathroom and wash myself off. I walked in, and I saw Emma's back. She was all turned around. I said hi to her and went to get some paper towels and from the dispenser, and I saw that Emma's mittens were on the sink. Want to play the secret game? Emma asked me, still looking at the wall with her hands up to her face, like she was counting for hide-and-go-seek. She made funny sounds too, like my puppy did when we fed him. How do you play? I asked. I tell you a secret, and you never ever tell anyone, she said as she made more little sounds. Okay, I told her. I found something that wasn't dirty. I'm not dirty. She turned around, and I screamed, and I ran real fast like when Emma would race with me. I realized that she never sharpened her pencils onto her desk. She had her broken sharpener in one hand, 
The one where the plastic was torn off. Parts of Emma's hands were missing and torn up and shaved off and bitten. Other parts were black with yellowish stuff coming out. She had pieces, little pieces stuck to her lips and teeth. I ran and I ran and I cried into Mrs. Moyer's hip. I didn't want to play the secret game. I told her that Emma's mittens were eating her. She laughed at me and told me that mittens couldn't eat people. But I cried and I cried until Mrs. Moyer left to go talk to Emma about scaring me. Emma wasn't in class for a long, long time after that. The principal said that no one could wear gloves or mittens anymore. And we got new desks without cubbies in them. And the school nurse had everyone come into her office, one at a time, to look at our hands. All the kids in my class got papers for our mommies taped to our backpacks. And they were all about Emma. And my mommy said I couldn't be her friend ever again. When Emma did come back, she still got to have a mitten. One little empty blue mitten. Her other mitten ate her hand clean off. And she had a smooth place all around her wrist instead. Mrs. Moyer let her wear it over the place where her hand used to be because everyone kept looking at the stub. Emma didn't talk to anyone, and she didn't color. And sometimes, I watched her stare blankly out the window, biting at the inside of her cheeks. And she would whisper to herself that her mouth wasn't dirty. Thank you all so much for listening to this newest edition of seven micropasses to keep you up tonight. I'm sorry it took so long. It was over a year ago that I did volume six, but I had no intention of discontinuing the series. I'd like to thank fellow narrators King Spook and Fear Itself for helping with this collection by suggesting stories to put into it. Thanks guys. This is Master DK, and make sure you check all corners tonight. Ha, 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 ha.